Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Nasheed Chaudhry. I'm the Economic Development Lead at the City of Joondla and also a Billboard member of WA or Cyber. Um, I'd like to acknowledge our acting CEO, Matt Humphrey, who's here today, and nine expert presenters across the room. Um, we've got four cyber security companies in the house. We have uh, representatives of ECU, North Metro TAFE, parents, teachers, and most importantly, students here who are to, here today. Welcome. Um, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the past and present um, traditional owners of the land we're meeting on, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, their elders both past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge the 200 cultures that reside here in Australia today. Who are we? We're the city of Joondalup. So we're the third largest local government by population. Uh, with over, just over 161,000 residents and over 13,000 businesses. We're one of eight strategic commercial centres um, and we're a bit different. Our city's come a long way in a relatively short period of time. We've just celebrated 20 years um, in the city in 2018 and we're now sort of transitioning from an economy that's sort of been, um, the growth of it has stemmed from population to actually now becoming more about entrepreneurship and innovation and about growing jobs here, which is, which is um, really, really important to us and which is why we're here today. Um, so what makes us really, really unique? We're, we're a city that's built on knowledge. You know, we've got ECU, we've got the North Metro Chase, we've got the Junior Up Learning Precinct here, and that's really helped us create that place for innovation and creativity and helped us grow a range of sectors. But most importantly, we're the capital of cybersecurity, you know, and cybersecurity is really, really important into the coming um, era and with the soaring cost of cybercrime across globally. Um, cybersecurity is set to take over the mining boom in Australia, so which is why it's really, really important to really grow the skills, grow the people, grow the talent in this sector. Um, we're just one of we're um, one of five cyber hubs in Australia, with WAF Cyber here. We're the only one where local government's involved, and we're really, really proud to be involved in the growth of that industry here in Joondla. Um, we're a key partner, and we've actually recently signed an MOU with WAF Cyber, and it's about growing smart jobs, the buzzword that Glenn and I were just talking about before. Um, it's about raising cyber, cyber security awareness in the community, but more importantly for SMEs. You know, 90% um, of SMEs who are hit or attacked by cyber security don't recover. And the onflow effects of that are quite detrimental to the economy. So we play a really strong role in trying to raise that awareness. Um, and also, um, most importantly, it's about building our cyber army. It's about you, it's about the talent. It's about making sure that not only do you learn about cyber, not only do you build your skills, but you find your career here and grow your career here. Um, just by way of background, I'm not a cyber security expert by any, any means or forms, but I was a programming analyst many, many years. I was terrible at it, and I ended up with a job in marketing, and through many ways and forms, I've landed a role, um, a career in trade and investment. But, um, I do have some linkages in that sense, but really, really proud to be able to grow that industry here in Jindala. So, um, how can we help you? As a city, we've got a jobs portal, so you can actually apply for jobs in Jindala, but we offer a lot of work integrated learning opportunities. And right now, we are actually mapping out a, quite a, a few cyber internship opportunities for students to come and actually work um, on internships in the city. We're also a founding member of Cyber Check Me, which you'll hear about later today. And Cyber Check Me is an opportunity to raise awareness, and it's in partnership with ECU, North Metro Tape, City of Wanneroo, and the Cyber Research Centre. And the opportunity for you is paid work. So for students who actually undertake cyber security, um, not only are we raising awareness for businesses, but for students, it's an opportunity to actually apply the skills and actually get paid work around cyber security. Uh, we also run an accelerator program, my colleague here, Ben Garcia, it's called the Digital Ready Program, and it's about raise, helping businesses transform digitally, but also raising 
um, helping them build their cyber resilience in the business. And we've got Silvana here at the back of the room. The opportunity for students is that Silvana works with students to help deliver that program. And we've got Viv sitting right next to her, who is an intern on that program during that time. And Viv now works for HBF. So the pathways for your career um, is endless. And it's about, the work we do is about looking at the skills gap, the experience gap and trying to bridge that experience gap so that you can actually go and work in the industry with experience. Um, another one that's really close to what we did last year when COVID hit, we actually started an initiative called the Joondalup Innovation Challenge, which is a partnership between us, ECU, North Metro TAFE, UWA, Curtin University, um, Space Cubed, Joondalup Business Association. And that was a hackathon in, in effect, a three day, and as we used to call it, a mini MBA, where you would get an opportunity to solve Joondalup's challenges. And the second uh, winning team was solving a challenge around cyber. You know, we had experts like Glenn um, come in and speak to the students, um, but also help them shape their problem. So again, another really good opportunity. Um, for more information, um, go on to our website. Feel free to speak to any one of us. Um, but if you've got any weird, wacky ideas around cyber, come and talk to us because we love listening to new concepts and ideas and try and connect you to, the, to places to land it. Um, my two bits worth around career journeys and aspirations. Um, one thing I've found is you need to find what you like doing, what you love doing actually. You need to be passionate. You need to be authentic. You need to be inquisitive. You need to be smart about what you're doing. You know, connect with people, collaborate with people. And that you never know where your next conversation is going to take you. I'd like to thank you all for attending today's event, and I'm really, really inspired and encouraged by the collaboration and the willingness. Thank you, ECU, for hosting this today and making us a partner on it. And I'd love to introduce Simon Carabita, who I call the Cyber Guru, because he's a teacher by background, and he worked for the Department of Education and made a career change, like I've done quite a few career changes, but completely in the right direction of cyber security. And he is now the stakeholder engagement manager at WA of Cyber. So, you know, your path can go many ways. It's about the connections and the journey you take. Thank you, Simon. Thank you very much, Nasheed. I think, um, thank you for that introduction, Guru. Ooh. It's, a, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a term, but thank you, I'll wear it. Um, look, thank you so much for coming. So I just was looking at, around the room. This is for the WA Oz Cyber Innovation Hub. This is our first real event for the year, and it's it's huge. A, a big round of applause for you for coming out tonight and making the effort on a Thursday weeknight, um, especially you school kids coming off the end of a big day at school, annoying your teachers, and then coming here to um, kind of be part of the cyber security um, information session. So, yeah, well done, guys. Um, Big hello to everybody listening virtually right now. So I'm probably going to be turning to the side. It's not because I have a problem. It's because there's people watching virtually um, all across the country. We've got people tuning in from Adelaide at the moment and um, from New South Wales um, because they've got a big interest over there and what we're doing around cybersecurity engagement with the schools. And as Nashit said, I, um, being a former high school teacher, I've got a bit of a vested interest in this in engaging with the schools and growing the cybersecurity industry from the ground up. I'm really a big advocate of grassroots cybersecurity. Um, so yeah, as she said, I'm the project and engagement coordinator for the WA OS Cyber Innovation Hub, which is the WA node of um, OS Cyber, which is the growth network for cybersecurity. And this is kind of part of what we do, but it's the operating and butter in growing the industry. We have some fantastic uh, speakers tonight. We've got four cybersecurity sorry, we've got four cybersecurity gurus tonight. They're the real <laughs> gurus. They're going to be talking about what they do and the businesses they run. And then we have some education gurus who are going to partake in a little panel discussion at the end. And then I'd really like to open the floor up to you guys, who I'm sure have so many burning questions um, that you'd like to ask anyone that um, participated tonight. So for those of you watching out there in TV land, for those of you who are here tonight, you're in for a real treat. 
I would like to um, uh, introduce our first guru tonight. You've set the trend, by the way, this year. Thank you. Um, our first cyber guru tonight. Um, he is the CEO of, and when you speak about his company, I mean anyone in the cyber security, in cyber security circles in WA will know straight away who they are. So the CEO of Red Piranha, Adam Bennett. Thank you. I don't have any slides. Does it matter? No. Let's have a chat. So we've got a couple of young faces here. So who's at high school? Cool. What, year 11, 12, 10? <laughs> All right. Who's got a master's? No one. And generally at uni, doing other things? Yeah, a couple. Just trying to get a feel of all the students in the room. I know all the industry people here, that's all right. And thanks for that kind introduction, both of you. It's, um, I'm not sure about this whole guru thing. Um, <laughs> bit nutty, maybe, but so. Uh, look, yeah, I'm from Red Piranha. We um, started up about, uh, started on the project about eight years ago. Uh, we now have six offices and I think nearly 100 people um, around the world. Uh, and being from Perth, still got a rather strong operational team here, both in security operations, uh, in development, and other things. And uh, we essentially invented the concept of what's called now a whole market segment called XDR, which stands for the X factor in cyber security, but extended detection and response capabilities. Um, essentially it's taking a unified approach to putting in multiple functions of the security sort of program into a single operating uh, solution, I suppose, because one of the problems we noticed, well, I noticed years ago was you know, to put a holistic program into place it took many vendors, many products, uh, a, a massive amount of overhead to introduce those uh, multiple vendor products into an environment. And as our environments grew more and more, uh, that became the technical debt, I suppose, the, the, the management burden to, to first implement this and make it work was huge. And most organisations just, you know, this is out of reach, right? So even today, with what's happening in this amazing explosion, I suppose, of, of people trying to deal with cyber security. Most IT teams are small, you know, maybe there might be one security person. You know, even banks now are starting to try and scale back cyber security teams a little bit and look for other solutions because, you know, it is, it is actually a complex subject. And this is why we need you guys as students to be involved. Because if I go back to my time here, I'm getting on a bit. Um, you know, when I went to school, most schools had one computer in the library, and I went to BBC yeah. Acorn. Right. That's right. The internet wasn't around, games weren't around as you kids know today, you're pretty lucky. Uh, and I was very lucky to go to a new school and had a teacher who was interested in technology. And we built, we were actually the first uh, high school, well, back then it was TEE, which is the, what do you call it now? ATAR. ATAR. Um, yeah, it was the first, we were the first class to do ATAR equivalent computer science. And we, in a sense, wrote the course. Uh, and in doing that, when we built the new school, we built a network. It's one of the first networks, one of the first network I've ever seen. Um, so I was very lucky, and of course, once I got to build this network, I was hooked, essentially. And then I was also very lucky to go on and do my work experience with a crazy person called Alan Bond. Uh, back then, in the 80s. <laughs> he was a very successful man. He won the America's Cup and he had money coming everywhere with his businesses. And he built a world class group information technology center here in Perth. In fact, one of the most advanced at its time, just that, so, that year. Uh, when we talk about mainframes, and the whole global empire of this business ran from the RI Tower after it was built. And he spent an exorbitant amount of money on this uh, technology computer system. And I was very lucky to go do my work experience in that building, which got me working on mainframes and on cutting edge technology, which then of course set the, the tone for learning, right? For, for just being curious and learning. And now come to Red Piranha. So what my point being is that, you know, these are really important networks that you start to build today. It's uh, a great industry to be part of, and uh, we have three uh, working integrated learning students in our office right now in Perth. Um, 
with us for 12 weeks. They just started this week, didn't they? Well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we had some last semester. So, you know, this is a really exciting industry. You know, when I left TAFE back in the year it was, uh, <laughs> a long time ago, when I left TAFE, they were, there wasn't, uh, university wasn't doing computer science back then. TAFE was the, the, the main area to go. And uh, I went into the security industry and back then. It was just security, it wasn't cyber security. Uh, email had just started being used, right? Like the internet had just started. And there was a bit of a need for uh, people who had that security. And of course, that led into today. Um, I wanted me to talk a little bit about startups too today. Uh, so when you're thinking of a product or, or a solution to a problem, um, yeah, it's a bit of a journey. With Brett Verona, it started off with me, and then it went to three people. And uh, it was built out of Scarborough, literally in my uh, spare room office that I have there. Uh, and by the time we even got to Brett Verona, being Brett Verona, uh, about two to three years, we'd already done about 40,000 hours of development. And that was even before we got to pitching the seed capital or anything like that. There's a, a whole process involved with that as well. Uh, Australia is actually a little bit different to say like America where they have an entrepreneurial uh, process where they back. Uh, you'll be asked to actually come up with a, a product first before you try and raise money and that can quite cause uh, all sorts of issues here. Um, but if you've got an idea, stick to it. You know, you can work on it on the side. These guys in high school, guys and girls in high school, who's writing code at this point in time? You're the ones people, employers will be looking out for. Get involved in those extra, extracurricular projects. You know, one of the things I was asked earlier, um, you know, with Red Piranha, how did it get started? Well, I was an admin of an ISP and, and we used to work on what's called BSDI, which Mac now owns and runs on. And this was back uh, before 2.1, that was the last one. But back then, that was a proprietary unique system. We couldn't take our work home. We couldn't work on code like these guys have now if this was a paid system at work and when we went home, we were stuck using other stuff and it really used to annoy us. So this is where the whole Linux program came about, right? And it was in forums back before the 93. But this really allowed us to engage with people all around the world because the internet just started and we built those networks, I built those networks. And when it came time for me, for Red Piranha, eight years ago, I was able to draw on some of these connections as kernel developers, very specialised type engineers, and say, hey, I'm doing this, I've just built this, have a look at this, and of course, some of those now work for me, and have been with me for the, since the early days of the company. So you can build these relationships through extracurricular activity, not just to show in future employees, employers about work that you're doing, how good you are in your skills as well in a portfolio, but also in the future of potentially starting your own startup. You know, these uh, connections that you make could be future partners, um, and they could be essentially involved in, in you solving some sort of engineering problem too in the future. So yes, get involved, it's great to see you out tonight. I hope you've got lots of questions. Um, happy to take some now if you want, we can wait for the end. We'll take a couple now. Take a couple now, I want to leave five minutes for questions, so we can have a chat about what you're doing and what's happening. So you could be young guys if you want. Come on, don't be shy. Are you working on any projects at the moment? Really? No. I'm, I'm a teacher at the Young Guys, cool. so I've got a question. I'm just wondering, um, to talk about work integrated learning, yeah. um, is that primarily for university and tertiary students, or is there an option for the paid year level 12 students? Yeah, look, we were really hesitant. We're, we're a really fast moving company. We've sort of got to five, you know, three to five, to 15, and we jumped to 50 really quickly. Mm -hmm. Now we just jumped to nearly 100 in the last 10 months. And while that doesn't put a lot of pressure on our own organisation, training new people, so, we were pretty hesitant on the whole work experience thing before. Um, we tried the wheel program last year with ECU, and we talked about it for a while, and we did that. And where I suppose that really made sense for us is the length of the program, that embedding in the organisation. We can go through two weeks of training. Um, we've been really hoping over east, and that does it as well, because there's a real shortage of staff over east uh, as well. But um, we haven't gone down the work experience line because legal and want us to do interns for obvious reasons, there's a whole 
the, 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 the program sort of made sense. I think where we were looking to try to go, we partnered with North Metro Tugs recently, and we partnered with another university up in America and Europe, and we're running a program at the moment uh, for students, like at, at, at the actual uh, education facility. So we're setting up a training course and then our equipment that they can do threat hunting and, and with our people on. Uh, and we're sort of just trying to roll that out at the moment. The core, half the course is done online, uh, and then we've got the gear. So it's something that we're going to try and do more of for young people, uh, to try and particularly get them thinking a little bit more about threat hunting as well. Uh, we've got a real opportunity here in WA, because we've got two viable, use that term loosely too, the two network uh, protection technologies that are you know, not similar, but they, you know, in the world cyber, there's a lot of different areas that you can be involved in, right? And they're actually similar, more similar than they are alike in that sense. Particularly around the things like threat hunting, like rule writing, and these are really specialised type skill sets that we have a chance in WA to be a world leader in. Uh, we'd really like to see the WA government doing more here too, because I don't think they grasp that, you know, I get to you, that, that, that capability that we could be building out here. I mean, you're talking about in certain rule sets being developed, there used to be about 15 to 30 open source developers in this a couple of years ago. And one company in America came through and took them all out in like one hit and left that open community mm -hmm. at zero. And we've just spent the last five years training on ourselves because it's something that I'm involved in. And uh, I would really like to see those type of capabilities built out here. And they're something that I'm passionate about trying to get in because everyone goes through three these days and wants to be a red team or pen tester, right? But there's so much more than, and Trust me when I say, you know, blue team is actually a lot of fun too because you, you get to hunt, there's the threat intelligence side, you get to yeah, go down the rabbit hole, you know, just as much, if not more, than a red teamer. You know? So, you know, when you're thinking about cyber security, think, there's, I think there's, what, 200 academically, 200 different jobs now, roles in cyber security, which is absolutely incredible considering that, you know, I think back to my start of my career, I was just lucky in, Hey, he's just a nerd guy who does security. You know, when you do security, so you wouldn't like what to even have a thing. So. Um, mine is very similar to the Cosby teacher. Um, so, what about for instead of like the young ones, sorry, young ones, um, <laughs> those who are slightly older and doing career changes and yeah. trying to break into that, mm -hmm. um, what opportunities actually exist for us? Eats. Mm. I can't find them. We've got one right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you talk honestly, about honestly, as an organisation, we're having to take on uh, quite a lot of unskilled staff and trainers. Uh, when I say unskilled, I'm saying, look, don't get yeah, it. Don't get off being around the bush. You don't get a degree and then expect to know everything. It takes years yes, in any industry enough. to learn, 10 years to learn your craft, right? So when you say, what opportunities have you? Lots, because one of the things as an employer that I'm looking for is, that's why when I'm talking to the young uh, people, I'm saying, all right, well, I'm going to look for those extra curricular activities that you've done, those side projects. Everyone's got good grades, maybe, but the thing that's going to make you stand out is, I'm going to look at that code, I'm going to be able to see something about you in that side project. For the mature age students, I'm doing the same thing, because what happens when you get a 25-year-old in your business? <laughs> I'll put the mature age of 35 and the young person of 25. Yeah. So a hypothetical. But what we're looking for there is experience in the real world. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'll tell you right now what makes the best pen tester is somebody knows systems. So if somebody has never used systems before, how do they get that perception about what they're breaking into? And the same thing with blue teamers or, 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 or any, any field. If you've got a wider view of knowledge, so uh, you become more useful. And so mature age students can really draw on this life experience. You know, even jobs in whatever, like think back and all of a sudden they've got a wider experience level of an understanding and they can apply that in the industry. Because in the industry, we don't just need incident responders and red teams. You know, we need salespeople, we need marketers. I mean, how hard is it to find support staff across the board? But then, um, like we're find, a lot of us are finding the problems, and it's a very big conversation on LinkedIn where you look at a job even for like a level one, just IT, an IT support, and they're wanting five years experience. Yeah. They're wanting all these certificates, and it's like, well, 
But that's the opportunity to put yourself out there, have yeah. that conversation. I'll tell you right now, there's sort of a long link on that subject. Yeah. I'm talking about the, the, what do they call it? People are, it's like an underworld of job hiring, and that happens. Like, you know, this is where your networking and events like this come in play too. Often the, the good jobs are uh, taken before they're advertised. It's like a, you know, things that are tenders and things like that. It's the same, it's the way the world works, right? So what you want to do is build up that. Don't be afraid to put yourself out there. Because if you do have a skill set, and, and also, if you have a skill set, the company will seek you out too, in a sense. But also from that perspective, don't be knocked back by a rejection, because a lot of the times a business is looking for a specific thing at a specific time. That suits what's happening in that organisation at that time. And it doesn't mean you're not suitable for the role. In fact, you could actually be at some time more suitable if that was in a different environment or mm. business. Get what I'm saying? Okay. So it's not always, um, yeah, it's not always, it's just a timing thing sometimes. But, and that's what we always say, you know, don't be afraid to come and apply again if you've got through the interview stage because um, you know, often it's about that, who that person's going to work with at a certain time too, you know, in a team environment. And, um, and you'd also let so add, we'll, um, oh. yeah, we might leave more questions for okay. the end, so. <laughs> but still, yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you anyway. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Adam. Um, I also need to acknowledge tonight Kunjal, my fantastic volunteer who's filming this. So that, Hi, everyone. Thank you, yeah, thank you, guys. And thank you, Kunjal. It's a, it's a big job. But look, so that you people watching over there don't have to see the side of people. You can watch this later on. Um, and I'll put that up and um, point to that once it's um, edited. Because all my blueprints will be taken right out of that. So. Um, yeah, thank you again, um, Adam, for that. And you touched on some really good points there, um, particularly around startups, um, but also the multitude of different roles, different jobs there are. I just realised I was on that way too close to my mouth. Um, the multitude of different jobs there are with inside security. In fact, I was at um, John Kirk College of the Arts with a fantastic Donna Buckley um, last week, and I just put up on the slides the, um, only about 30 or so job, different types of jobs, and that was only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to cyber security. There are a lot of different um, hard skills and soft skills that are required across the board. Um, so again, next to my next speaker, um, I mentioned Brett Verano being you know extremely well known within cyber security circles, but I'm going to bring on someone who is the um, the CEO of a company that needs no introduction to anyone in cybersecurity as well. So I'd like to introduce you to Glenn Murray, CEO of Save and Cyber. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I'll just um, maybe say slide. Just next slide. So just so I can give a, a feel, so I didn't get to see their hands up. So we've got students, obviously. Um, do we have people here just doing undergrad? And any, uh, and we have masters, I think, at the back there. Um, any PhD? Excellent. So, so that's very important because within education, there is a, um, uh, I liken it to, this is not going to work, so I'm going to use my hands away from the microphone. You start out here, right, when you're, when you're learning as a kid or as a, as a student. And as you get more and more through that education period, you start doing this. So then you get to high school and you start narrowing it down a bit more. And then when you get to university or TAFE, you start narrowing it more. And when you're doing your master's, you start narrowing your field. And then all of a sudden, you do your PhD and you become really pointed. So, <laughs> point being is PhD should just get really pointed. Um, <laughs> so, I think I've broken it down. One. Okay. All right, so, in order for me to talk about operational technology and critical infrastructure, I think it's very important to understand what IT infrastructure is. Right, and so you can see some of the things on the on the screen there. You know, everything from the computer screen you can see in front of you to there'll be some kind of network switch around here somewhere. Um, there's going to be uh, a data center and so forth. All commonly known as IT infrastructure. We'll make that basis now. We we'll move forward. So, if I was to make a broad statement and say operational technology can be defined as an operation of cyber physical systems. What I mean by that? is something that can be controlled by a signal. So if anyone's familiar with what they call programmable logical controllers or a computing system. And they're used to conduct mission critical 
of this lesson. So I'll give you one example, and then this is where we become really interactive. So my first example of one of these systems would be a water facilities, so a water treatment plant. Okay, so they've got the ability within that plant to do all the treatment they need to do to um, make the water safe for what we, uh, we drink today. So can anyone else give me an example of what would be a critical infrastructure or an operation technology? Sure. Electricity. Electricity, for Any others? Yep. Power. Power, yeah, yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah. so we've got oil and gas, we've got hospitals, we've got um, building management systems. They're all what we call operational technology. And so what we've got the difference now is between what they call the IT space, which everyone here is very familiar with, with the OT space. And what we're seeing now is that conversions happen. We're actually seeing the IT stuff getting into the OT space which is very dangerous because the OT space has never had the same level of protection as we do in the IT space. It's lagged by a number of years. So, here are my examples. So, you've got uh, water plants, manufacturing, rail, aviation. These are all examples of operational technology. So, the next logical question is the, the what-if question. So, and next. So, we see here water plants. What happens if there's a cyber attack? Well, it proven last week in the US that uh, the cyber criminal was able to get into um, uh, the body facilities plant and change uh, the level of a, um, a critical chemical that's used to take away metals out of there and increase the level of, of that. And if that was to get into the water supply, we could have done potentially been quite fatal. So there's a huge impact in the OT space. Um, some other things you can see on there, is um, if we jump down to, so oil and gas plants. You know, so now we've got a live operating plant, probably offshore, and in Western Australia, we're very familiar with you know, resource sectors and oil and gas and so forth. So if something goes wrong in an oil and gas plant, A, you could be miles offshore, but B, you could cause a fire. Once you cause a fire on one of these offshore assets, it's pretty hard to stop it. But more importantly, and especially for the uh, younger generation, and you know, maybe for the older generation as well, you go to the next. You're gonna, if you lose your electricity, you, use, you lose your Wi Fi, you lose your social media, you lose your gaming, and your mobile phones will stop to uh, operate after a period of time as well. It's been quite devastating. and severity, disrupting our everyday lives. With the fourth industrial revolution, Industry 4.0, driving change, the convergence of IT and OT systems has transformed how we manage critical infrastructure for improved efficiencies and productivity. To realise these benefits, ageing and previously isolated systems have been connected to the outside world, becoming vulnerable new targets of opportunity for cyber criminals. Now, the damage caused by cyber attacks on our industrial infrastructure, utilities, manufacturing facilities and critical infrastructure can have catastrophic consequences, resulting in significant financial losses, or much worse, loss of life. The good news is there is a solution, one that changes the cyber security landscape forever. Then we're looking at about a 32 millisecond gap between you being able to access anything at all. 
So we've taken this idea of distance out of the equation. So that's why you see cyber criminals being able to attack anywhere. Yeah, and you'll hear you know the news and that, and they'll say things like you know nation state attacking, and that they might be attacking somewhere in the US or somewhere else. How do they do that? It's still this wonderful tool called the internet. And so we use it in our everyday lives, and they use it as well. And so you can see here, um, now this was back in 2018, so I should update this slide, but back then they were saying all the cyber attacks in the world, 30% of them were targeting critical infrastructure. Yeah, so that's the water you drink, the water your family drinks, the water your friends drink. It's the electricity that powers your, your house, your gas that fires your hot plates and so forth, all being targeted. And so is this real? Well, these are all the attacks you know, happening around the world. So um, everywhere from uh, Iran, um, US, Saudi, Australia. And you can see, you know, we've got hospitals, logistics, um, um, alcohol beverage companies. Um, aluminium, you know, devastating, yeah. Space and uh, defense, you know, everywhere is, is vulnerable, right? So there's, there's no, and the thing about a cyber attack, sometimes it's not, it's not targeted, it could be a drive-by, see if they can. Um, a lot of times you'll see um, in this space that it's the can I do it effect. You know, can I break into that system? You know, I remember it was a, last year, the year before, Tom Flies, there was a 16 year old uh, guy who downloaded, I think, something like two, two gig of sensitive files from, from Apple. You know, his end game was to get a job with Apple, but, you know, what he did was, was a criminal act to do that. Um, and so, if you look at the cyber, uh, the cyber crime cost today, we're looking at about $10.5 trillion by 2025. So put a number around it, it's quite a big number. So it could be one trillion, 10 trillion, the fact is it's a big number. And for everyone in this room who's looking at doing cyber security, what an exciting time to be in cyber security. You know, you've chosen the right field, and this is a growing field. And as she was saying, I think, you know, this is gonna outgrow the mining and the resource. And if you know how big that is, this is a quite an, you know, an extensive uh, uh, effect to our economy. Thanks, Tom. And so what you'll find is there's companies like the companies represented here today that, that have dedicated resources, dollars, creating solutions to really um, disrupt the cyber criminal. What Adam was saying, when I grew up, there wasn't all these cyber security companies. So I had to join the military, which was uh, not but, <laughs> In that, in that, you know, right now, it's exciting because there's so many opportunities, there's so many jobs, you know, and to your question of the back there, yeah, look, come speak to us, you know, like we are, um, we've got about, I don't know, five to ten jobs advertised right now, um, finding the right people for those jobs is, is hard, so, you know, and um, like other companies, we run Will student programs, um, I was just having a quick conversation with Simon about, uh, yeah, we will take on um, you learn the 12 students who are doing the, the um, was it a two week uh, job experience for sure? Yeah, whatever it is. Um, to give the exposure, you know, to see, you know, because it can be very exciting being involved in these, uh, in these environments. Now, we've had a few people allude to the jobs in cyber security. So these are typical types of jobs, and as uh, you've heard previously, this is literally the tip of the iceberg, but I can only get so many on one slide. But if you look on the other side, these are all the soft. Um, skills that are needed as well. And these sometimes are the harder ones to get, believe it or not, because, well, we like them to have a little bit of cyber security knowledge to be able to do your job effectively in our company. And so, you know, finding you know, people who do human resources, so you can actually have to recruit the cyber security jobs. Um, <clears throat> project managers that can actually roll out and deploy multiple um, systems um, across the, you know, the globe and so forth as well. So. There's a, you know, a lot of soft jobs there as well. So I always, you know, I, I did a, a presentation this week with uh, the Australian uh, Chamber of Commerce. Um, and so I put these slides in because the question was asked, so what do we look for in, um, in safety and for the, the, the people? So these are actually our values and we follow these values quite closely. So we like people who are actually totally unreasonable. We, we want them to challenge the status quo. You know, if you've got this yearn to say, no, that's not right, I want to keep looking. That's the kind of thing we want. You know, we want people who don't think there's a finish line because if you've got a cyber criminal out there who's, you know, trying to attack something, they're not stopping. 
And one of the things that you always play as being a ethical cybersecurity person is you're always on defense. You know, and so if you're working on offense, um, you know, type you know, against a cyber criminal, you can't stop. And so you've got to keep going and going forward. We work in the in the environment where we give everyone bulletproof vests. You can't make a mistake. Um, you know, if you deliberately make a mistake, well then well that works. But if there is, you know, if you make a mistake, that's okay. We learn from that and we adjust. We're going to be customer obsessed. And why? It's because we set the critical infrastructure of the world. We want to be making sure that everyone who works for us, knows that and understands that that is the, the drive that we come to work for. And above everything, we need to be unnaturally curious. You want to be able to you know, think, you know, what is that? Is that different? Like, so you'll hear in, in terminology in cybersecurity, different ways of detecting threats. Everything from signature-based detection right through to what the industry loves to call artificial intelligence. Um, I don't believe in artificial intelligence, it's machine learning and deep learning. In that space, it's going to pick up an anomaly. Now there's two ways that a, like a cyber uh, analyst, cyber security analyst will look at that. One, to, to pass by, or the other thought process is, why is that different? Why is that different in that packet that's been, that hasn't occurred before? And that's what we look for. And this is why we do our job. So that was in the Gulf of Mexico, and put down to as a mechanical failure. Why? It's because if there was, if and you see this with the COVID, yeah. And if there, I wrote an article um, not long ago about the difference between bushfires and COVID. In the bushfires, you know, it was very common, and you saw it on the news all the time, and people, you know, neighbours or just random strangers were rushing to the aid of people in their front houses with hoses, garden hoses, trying to fight these massive fires. No chance. that they were given their lives to help someone else. And then we saw COVID, and then all of a sudden we're in the shopping centres yanking you know, toilet paper out of other people's hands. <laughs> and it's not, well, it doesn't make sense, right? And so I put it down to you can't see it, touch it, feel it. The human doesn't like to, under, if it can't understand it, can't see it, it doesn't know how to react. So that's the same thing as, you know, as we, uh, we work with on a, co on a constant basis, is that you've got to be able to work with that kind of intelligence. So Simon says I've spoken too much. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And um, uh, questions will be at yeah, the yeah. end. Fantastic. Right. Thank you so much. Um, and I guess speaking of critical infrastructure and operational technology, it's extremely important today. Um, so a bit of background, so I used to do security awareness training for the Water Corporation. Um, so our water, basically. Um, our lifeline. So if you talk about, if you look at what's happened in the last couple of weeks and the, um, the attack in Florida on the, the water treatment plant, um, these are very real things that can happen if the operational technology and the IT security teams aren't at the very top of their game. So this is the kind of um, these, these attacks that we are living with today that are very, very real threats. Um, so yeah, so thank you very much for that, Glenn. And um, this next person uh, I'm going to introduce is at the very forefront when it comes to delivering, as I did, awareness training. Um, she has been around the game for a while now and she has got the absolute gift of the game when it comes to cyber security. She sells the cyber. <laughs> Why? Why do we need cyber security? She'll tell you that very, very well tonight as well. Um, I should also disclose, <clears throat> she's a blood relative, but that's <laughs> not a story. Um, but anyway, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Silvana Macri, the Chief Cyber Saver at Stay Cyber Safe. Thank you. Hi. How are you? Are you good? Excellent. Nice to see you. Uh, Sarah's going to plug me in. I've got... <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions too, okay? So no sleeping. I can see you down the back. So I'm going to talk to you about um, the awareness space. I thought I'd uh, 
change it, change it up as I always do a little bit and talk to you about uh, the industry, um, why we're in the industry and it's not all about the money, but I'll talk to you about the money as well because obviously that's a motivator as well. Okay, I don't know if you know about Zoolander. Can you go back, Simo? Okay, but who's, who knows, who remembers Zoolander? Okay, so just bear with me, probably shows my age, but look at these two guys going, the files are in the computer. Okay, and that's the old, one of the old Macs. What's that model? Who can, who can remember that model where it's all in the one piece? That's yeah. Apple. The iMac. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so there's going to be lots of Zoolander memes um, in this preso. Mm -hmm. And that's me, and that's a beautiful free for commercial use picture of Perth, now Skyline. And how lucky are we? to be living in Perth, there's a few more of those, Simo. Uh, lots of lovely images, so um, who's happy to be where we are right now and no other city in the world? Let me tell you some of the stats around why you should be happy. So we're ranked 14th most livable city in the world by the uh, Economist Intelligence Unit. I don't care about this anyway, but humble Perth achieved nearly the perfect scores for healthcare, education, infrastructure, uh, and our lifestyle, and you really couldn't ask for anything less. Um, okay, don't go, go to the next slide. So let's just go over there into some of the stats here. I should have some prizes for this. So who can tell me what they think uh, the average cost of a coffee is in Perth? <laughs> Add four. Okay, cool. No slide. Next slide. Average gym. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Perth. Thank you, sir. 
okay? And Perth, oh, you can't see the reference to the Zoolander, is so hot, literally. <laughs> when my air conditioner broke last week, it's so hot right now. Okay, that's another Zoolander reference. So let's have a look at some of the stats. Okay, keep going, thank you. Okay, tech talent in demand skills and top tech sectors. So let's drop that down. Thank you, sir. Okay, there's 27 and a half, roughly, technology professionals. This is in the city of Perth with an average tenure. So how long we stay in a particular role or in a particular job, um, specifically role, of 1.7 years. That's interesting, isn't it? For those of you like me who are a bit older, I know my turnaround time in a particular contract, so I run my own business, but we contract, is two years and then they expire. Okay, I need to move on <laughs> before I explode. Okay, or scratch someone's eyes out. Okay, and then, so in demand skills, cloud tech. So who understands cloud? Who understands when I talk about Amazon and Google, Facebook, okay, all the cloud, okay, AWS, cool, very good. Okay, so cloud technology, so Azure, which is the Microsoft equivalent or the offering. ICT architecture, cyber security, there we are, ServiceNow, Vital, Agile.net, React, Python. Okay, who knows how to code in Python? Excellent. Okay, who knows how to, who's had a go at coding in PowerShell? That's an interesting one. Oh, keep practicing. That's where I put my money. I was going to put some money somewhere. And in Bitcoin, but that's another story. Okay, uh, and top tech sectors, tier one resources, so capital making big longevity mines, WA government, technology service integrators, software development houses. Actually, let's talk about WA government because they have just, didn't they just publish their pen testing roles yesterday? We all know, we all look, which is really interesting. And so they're establishing their own security operations centre. So the roles that we have in industry are now being offered in government as well, state government. Cool, I might have another slide after that one. Fast hiring jobs, in-demand benefits, gender identity. So again, this is very binary, the data we have. So it's very binary, so just bear with me, okay, here. So we're still looking at male, female percentages. Dave and I, she's going to pop up soon, but Dave and I work in a, an elite, I call it, and we're working with an A team, predominantly from X Banking, uh, and we are two, there are three females in a team of 24, 25, so we're, we're at 30%, so we're about close to that. Um, Cybersecurity so consultants, so fast hiring, as in lots of jobs and getting on the ground quick, okay, so it means literally for me, I had an interview for this particular role, I'm not kidding, at 1 p.m. and at 4 p.m. they rang me on the same day and said, when can you start? And I started two weeks after that. Okay, so it's really quick, okay? Um, data engineer, specialist, business analyst, IT architects, DevOps, DevOps, SEC, test analyst, okay? Pen testing, that sort of stuff in there as well, obviously here. What's really important to you, it's interesting when we work with people across generations because what's necessarily important to my generation isn't necessarily important maybe to your generation. Okay, so it's really important to understand that and we cater across generations. And that's something I don't think we do very well. Something I would say we could get better at. All right, so what's important is flexible working, Working from home, we've gone from working, we've gone to this model where we can work from home and I'm resisting going back into an office five days a week. Who else is with me? Okay, when, hello, when you can, thank you for being honest, when you can be as effective, if not more, working from home. Long term assignments, okay, so all these things mean something to us. There's a little bit more, so let's get to the next slide, please. Thank you, Glenn. Okay, so I did put some of the money in here. Permanent roles, uh, annual salaries, and contract rates are hourly. Okay, all data in, what is it, in what's the Australian currency? We should have our own currency, that'd be great. <laughs> salaries are exclusive. <laughs> Mark me down. Salaries are exclusive, super, and contract rate is uh, the rate, blah, 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 blah. Okay, what that means is, if you look, if I search for security in this data set, let me just pick up the security. 
security consultant. So low in a permanent position is starting around 140K. High at 170K. Contract rates, uh, I think they are the hourly rate. Yep, 110 per hour. Contract high rates around 150. Okay, so you can see it's good money. All right, so it's, think about that. Next one, next slide, please, one. But it's not all about the money. So these are things that are uh, important to us besides from the mula. Let's see. Okay, coaching and mentoring. Okay, that's really important to be uh, have a support framework in your work where you're coached, you're mentored, you get the opportunity to coach, and you get the opportunity to mentor. Okay, really important for us in this world. Okay, doesn't make sense to you to have a bit of a coach who can support you or mentor you? Would you like to be a coach or mentor to somebody else? Would that make you feel good? Makes me feel good. I've got one here, one I prepared earlier. <laughs> Let's bring Diva. So Dee's working with me. I met Dee two years ago at ECU here. I think we had like a career summit in the March, so it's probably two years to the day. And she came up and she said hello, right? And since then, she's been volunteering with me, working for me, now working alongside of me at HPF, working incredibly well. Um, and I want Dee to come up here because she's got a little story about she's a mature age, came from an accounting background, so she was an accountant all over the world, took a shift into cyber security and did a master's. Come on up. Excellent. We've had a hard day today. <laughs> so we're glad we're here. Hi everyone. Uh, so I'm, I'm Hidana. I've been here for the past three years, nearly three years now. And um, as I said, uh, I met her here two years ago. And now I'm just a student. And uh, I'm a very green girl, so. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, so it was quite. Uh, but it was very exciting for me actually to, to join the, the cyber industry because my background is accounting. I've been an accountant and worked there for uh, over 10 years. But, uh, and so I'm changing, I'm, I'm trying to change, I'm still trying to change cyber. And it's been, uh, it's been hard at the beginning, but uh, I did make it. And I'm currently working as a GRC, GRC analyst, so that's government, government risk and compliance. Uh, at HPF, and uh, I'm just using my accounting skills, my auditing skills, to do what I have to do at, uh, at HPF. And I'm working with people, I'm working with uh, uh, general topics, what, not general topics, but with members. So we are dealing with lots with people's information, and uh, yeah, I'm just happy where I am. So uh, no matter what uh, your previous skills, what your industry has been, if you want to move to cyber, uh, your past skills so is helpful. This is, yeah. Round of applause for the Very quickly. Okay, so next, flexibility. Again, the ability to work from home um, and have the flexibility of doing other things. So the value I have in doing the contracts, for example, that I'm doing, is I'm able to do other pieces of work as well and support the grads doing work for me um, around local government and critical infrastructure. So you don't just have the one job. How great is that? You can run your business and have a job somewhere else because that's when the bank will give you money to build stuff, okay? And But you can get all this stimulation from areas, different areas in, in your life. Okay, cool. And I think I've got one more. But this is so important. So making sure that you look after your health and, and be well. Right? And I work at... I sound like an HBF person here, okay, in terms of health and wellness, but it's really important that you, when you go and work somewhere, you understand that they support your health and your wellness. Um, they have an employee assistance program, so if you need or your family need that sort of support, this is the stuff we value, as well as, you know, the monetary benefits. Okay, really important. I know where we are, we have wellness days, and we have days where... Uh, you can go and volunteer in community and get paid for it, which is really cool. So the more you guys come to the workforce and insist that these are just non-negotiables, 
okay, the greater the, the path you pay, but what you do is empower everyone in the industry because everyone else will have to match it. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so stand your ground for these sorts of, I don't call them benefits, they're entitlements. Right, do you understand the difference? You're entitled to that. Okay, and reward and recognition, it's really interesting. So I talk about the guys and girls we work with. Oh, you cut me off? Oh, good. That's not wrong, me. Cut her off. Um, really, if you understand Maslow's hierarchy in psychology, it's really important to be rewarded or recognised and appreciated for what you do. So we talked about our strategy and they had to, um, one of the um, pillars, I think, was uh, a, a magnet for talent. And I challenged that in saying, how do you maintain and sustain that talent? so that they're not constantly coming to your organisation and leaving. And you're not asking the questions about why, why is that happening? So reward and recognition is really important in our industry because it keeps you going, doesn't it? Okay. Any questions about the data or further information, just get in touch. We're here. You'll get our email addresses, LinkedIn. That's really powerful for me, so make sure you connect to me via LinkedIn. Okay, that's it. Excellent. Uh, just while I set up, thanks very much for that, Silvana. Thank you. And thank you to Deviana for coming up and uh, Silvana for introducing Deviana. I met Dave about a couple of years ago um, when I was still just, I think even before I got my gig at Water Corp, before I'd even gotten into the industry. And um, seeing where she is right now is just absolutely inspiration. She's doing fantastic work alongside Silvana there. At HBA. All right. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you now to our final expert. I'll say the word again, guru. <laughs> for this evening. It's the middle. What have I done? There we go. I'll get it right eventually. Um, I guess when we talk about cybersecurity, that goes really hand in hand with data protection and your privacy. It, the two are almost um, um, not mutually exclusive anymore. So we, we really talked a lot today about um, how much of our information is actually out there and how much of our information we know about that is out there as well and what's happening with our information. And, and someone who's going to talk a bit about what they do in that space um, today um, runs a company that is really niche, really um, leading the way definitely in Australia, in terms of what they do in your in protecting your data and your privacy. And that's Dean Thompson, the CEO of Warden. Give a big hand for Dean, thanks guys. Hello everyone, thank you. And um, yes, it's, uh, I mean, the, the talks have gone to get well, I guess, so again, another field, I guess, of cybersecurity, like Simon said, um, data protection and privacy, is it, it sits with cyber security in a, in a lot of organisations, um, but it also has, um, it, it's, it's not at all in cyber security in some aspects. So um, today it's, it's an emerging, it's one of the fastest growing spaces uh, globally. Uh, it's driven by a global push um, for the modern privacy regulation essentially. Uh, and it's really changed the way companies do business. Um, and how cyber needs to interact with, with those businesses. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of, of the architecture privacy space. I'm not going to go um, too hard into it. Um, and the rest of it is really just some, um, I guess, some hopefully useful thoughts and tips um, on getting a cyber journal. Um, I uh, started in cyber security in at Bank West. Um, I, again, like most, people, most speakers, didn't study cyber security. Um, and uh, didn't go to uni, didn't get the uh, grades to get into uni. Um, and I think that's uh, probably a, uh, something that's learned across all the talks tonight is that you can, uh, there's a lot of ways to get into cyber security, right? And um, it's, it's really about uh, being a good team um, and being able to show that. Um, but uh, I'll get to that. Privacy has been around for a long time. Um, it's, it's a fundamental right. Um, it 
across who we are, how we interact with the world. That's one of the most important issues these days. Um, we, uh, modern privacy regulation um, essentially is just having to keep up with the technology um, and trying to provide guidelines for uh, how businesses use our personal data. Um, you would have seen in, in news about Facebook and Google, and you would have um, seen plenty of that. Um, but it's only in the last few years that strict rules and accountability has been uh, introduced. Um, and it's not even uh, those strict rules haven't really reached Australia yet. Um, in part of that. Um, last year, only 10% of the world population was covered under one, one privacy regulation, and it's 65% in the next three years, which shows how much it's going to grow. Um, and it, it's not only where the rule value is, um, is the guidelines for the businesses, but um, nothing really motivates business, businesses like uh, fines and some of the effects of bottom line. Um, in Europe, that's 4% of global turnover, so it uh, doesn't sound like much, but when you talk about billions, um, uh, some of these companies make, um, it certainly adds up. Over the last two years, since we've, we've gotten the real strict bottom privacy regulation in Europe, um, we've seen some of the last one. They're on the right. The, and you, you probably wouldn't have heard about a lot of these in the news. Like, they are, um, you hear about data breaches, you don't necessarily hear about compliance fines, because a lot of it's not as newsworthy, I guess. But um, these, these sort of things cost more, more than breaches, and it's really making the business sort of act, um, which in turn corrupts jobs. Um, another one of the things that's really important is the data protection laws.
My company, uh, we specialise in data protection. Um, we're the only ones who do it in Australia or in the Southern Hemisphere, really. Um, that's probably more talks to um, how new the space is more than anything. Um, and first, and uh, my background is cybersecurity and very technical. Um, and we do do the same, similar, um, protecting and preventing as a cybersecurity analyst or security operations analyst would do. Um, but one of the new aspects, aspects of uh, data protection is that it requires a lot of collaboration with essentially every corner of, of the business. Um, and, and that's for, we, uh, we're at, cybersecurity is very good at uh, protecting things from known stuff that we know. So there's very obvious um, data that is sensitive. So the ones that I read out, credit cards, tax file numbers, personal data. Um, but when you're talking about protecting sensitive business information, uh, cybersecurity are experts on every single business industry. So that means we've got to talk to them, we've got to get them involved. How do we, what's sensitive? How do we get you involved? How do we fix it if breach occurs? Um, but more importantly, how do we stop it happening that early? Um, and raising awareness of everyday people who aren't tech savvy is uh, probably the, the simplest way of, of preventing breaches, um, but it's also, as, as I've um, shown some stats before, it's pretty prevalent that uh, it's one of the major ways that this information actually gets out. This is why many cybersecurity skills um, aren't only about getting into, into cybersecurity. Um, it's becoming a necessity of life. Um, the, the list that the Glenn put up before, I think, was um, showing, and, and, and Silvana, showing all of the, uh, not just the security analysts, but human resources and, and management and accounting and all the skills. It's in, in most in tech-based organisations like banks, some security skills are needed in every single role. There's no, there's not really any exception. In the last half of last year, almost 40% of breaches in, in Australia, so that's in uh, industries, health, finance, education, government, were, were, were human error. So that's someone sending me on the wrong person, as I said. Uh, another common one is someone putting all the customer email addresses in the CC field instead of BCC field, and seeing it out so everyone can see it. That's another common one. No, no, no bad people involved, of course. Uh, that's 40% of, of almost 40% for every single breach that's notified. And if we talk about the cybersecurity incidents, so uh, the ones that do involve some, some sort of malicious person, bad person, a lot of them, uh, well, last six months of last year, 50% of them were essentially enabled by Someone just saying we've got a bad link. Uh, someone using the same password uh, at work as they did on a on a game. They got hacked a couple years ago and got dumped on the internet. Those are that's fifty percent of, of those on screen incidents. So these days, the biggest challenge really for cyber security is is, is people. Another, I guess, a duplicate of, of what's already been shown as well. Like, I mean, this has been done over a few times. Um, and the biggest problem is people. Because of this, the, it should be a surprise to know that like, a lot of the most desired skills in cyber security uh, aren't just technical ability. I mean, technical ability is poor for some roles, some of them purely technical. But these days, it's very hard to find the soft skills, leadership, influence, um, communication, things like that. Um, the ability to turn technical speak into to everyday language, so that we can we can educate. Um, and as always, your career is, is, is what you make of it. But uh, and there's no right or wrong path. Um, but something that doesn't get said enough is that many cyber security roles are essential, are, are very much leadership roles uh, in IT in general. Even if they don't have manager in the title, um, I learned pretty early on. Uh, bank versus cybersecurity. Cybersecurity touches every single part of IT. It's one of the only fields in IT that actually touches every single part of IT. Um, hardware applications, everything, cloud, operational technology, everything, uh, people. Um, so when major issues happen, when things go wrong, uh, uh, 
which they do a lot now too. Uh, all the additives. Um, security are the ones who are uh, it's, security are the ones who look to 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 help guide where the problem is. Even if it's not security related, uh, before anyone knows, it's even if it's even if it's redundant, before you even know, um, security is involved, and in a lot of cases, you're you're pulling the shots. That also means. Now, while well, a lot of the, the soft skills might not be uh, headliners, um, when you talk about careers, they need the first job is the first step. So, I mean, the first step is building a, a resume and getting that first job. Um, but the rest is really going to be putting those skills in practice. So, rather than um, resumes, not just one thing. So, if you're looking at anything, uh, anything outside of technical is still useful, leadership, and how do you, how do you Develop those skills, um, and really that's um, every day life. Um, leading sports team, leading group of players in a big game. Anything like that is more than uh, leading uh, someone else coming in and not having led anyone before. Huh? But getting your foot the door is, is, uh, is the hardest part. Um, and there's, there's no one way in soft security. It's, it's it's all of our backgrounds of sort of proof of that. Um, and meetings have a pretty good options, are both great options. Um, the some, I wish the cyber security tape courses were around when I, I did tape. I did the IT networking tape. Um, uh, like I said, I didn't get the grades in the year. Um, but the cyber security tape courses now, um, yeah, I wish they were around when I, when I did. But they're not a civil bullet. And there is pretty, I mean, there's a lot of demand in cyber but there's also a lot of competition. There's a lot of people who want to meet. Um, and not just grads, there's people who want to switch, right? Um, and, and as it has been gone over uh, time and time again tonight, um, and I'm going to reiterate it, um, it's really what I look for now that I uh, employ people um, is, is really being able to some, some examples of how things work. And that might be a project, as Adam said earlier, uh, that might be doing uh, self-learning certifications. There's a lot of really good, pretty inexpensive security certi certifications like OSCP or CompTIA. Um, that all that are very well about in industry. And they aren't uh, tens of thousands of dollars. They're, they're pretty good. Um, and I guess the, the last point I want to make is soft security is a, is a destination as well. So if you don't get in, if you don't get in straight out of the gate, um, which a lot of people don't. Um, I didn't. Um, pretty much every speaker getting like to think start as cyber security. Um, don't limit itself just to cyber security roles. Don't bash your head against it. There's, it's a perfectly legitimate um, method to go into other IT roles. Right? In fact, and Adam made this point earlier, um, knowing how things work in other IT fields is how you know how to protect it and break things. Um, I, did, I actually did service desk for uh, three different companies after I left Tate. Uh, and the way I got into security, I was at the service desk at Bank West. I essentially emailed on Friday, and I didn't really have much return, but I basically just asked, uh, what can I, to security manager at Bank West, what can I learn to get into security? And uh, I'm a player, I'm into security. So, I mean, there's opportunity. There's, there was, there happened to be some rules about it at the time, but I didn't have any uh, I didn't even have, I had nothing so screwed in my resume. Um, and, but what I did do was show how eager I was. And since then, really, I mean, I, I attribute my success since then to um, not really technical ability, but uh, the things I learned at service desk, customer service, uh, broad IT knowledge, uh, communication, those, those things are what have got me where I am, not necessarily, not just. Destination is well worth it. Um, and, and these points, I mean, the uh, curse of talking last is that some of the bottom of these points have already been made, but um, we're almost done. Wherever you go around the world, there's no way technology or business needs security. And soft security is one of the fastest growing industries worldwide, right? You can, you can go anywhere in the world and get a job like this. Um, and in every type of industry, uh, a big part 
if, if people are part of the problem, a big part of uh, cybersecurity is actually learning about the business that you work for. So if you're interested in a particular industry, um, there's nothing stopping you going for jobs, cybersecurity jobs in that industry and getting more involved with that sort of stuff. And, and while there's, there's likely to be an office and desk in the chair, it's the, the best job in many cases. Um, as Savannah made, uh, made the point, because working, work from home is pretty commonplace in IT. I work from home full time. Um, a lot of our customers, COVID accelerated this significantly. A lot of our customers, uh, we work remotely. Maybe 90% of our customers are in Greece. Um, um, but at the same time, we, I've, I've been able to travel the last few years, especially to every corner of Australia and New Zealand, um, and then come home and work from home, be with my kids, I've never had grown up. Um, that's been my process. But, um, and I guess the last point is, uh, IT and soft skills, skills are some of the most transferable skills for any, for any job. Um, you won't find many men in fields with, uh, today that are founded on technology. That's going to be a thing to do at some stage. Um, when I signed up for my first course of day, I did it out of uh, not knowing what to do, which, which a lot of kids do straight out of high school. Um, and I can't think of many professions that would be a better opportunity, even if that opportunity is in fitting somewhere else. But that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks very much, Dean. I'm, um, I love that advice you gave um, towards the end there as well about putting yourself out there and um, and really giving it a go because that's a lot of a lot of especially you guys and girls in high school are going to find that it's, it's probably going to come down to those who have. Um, who are well known and have actually got their, their face um, out there in front of these hiring managers and these uh, people within the industry who are going to get those positions. Um, that's fine, so you've made yourself well known and um, I'll have you up there. So I would like to introduce Dr. Michelle Ellis. Um, you know what, I'm not even going to say what she does, I'm going to get Michelle to say what she does because she does an amazing job here and I'm sure I won't even give justice to you what she does for the students here at ECU and for the School of Science and Cyber Security. So, here you go.
where I'll finish off with it. Uh, once upon a time, there was a, um, a building that was in between Cambridge University and Oxford University. And it played a very critical role in um, the world's history. One of the things about it, and the way that I understood it, was that uh, they had a team of mathematicians and uh, they needed to get some more people to work for them. So they put an advertisement in the paper and they asked for those people who like to do puzzles. And for those people who particularly like doing sort of like cryptic um, crosswords. And that was the interviewing kind of skills and techniques and what they were looking for to go and work with Alan Turing and the uh, cracking of the codes in the, uh, was it government coders and, I got you write it down, it was the government coders and cipher school. The Enigma journey, that's right. So what I was going to encourage you is to go and have a look at uh, some of the great hacker movies that are out there, but also the imitation game, and have a look at what people have done before you, learn from them, and go forward for yourself. I think I shall leave it there. I had one. Oh, there we go. It's gone again. Great. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Please take a seat because um, you'll be our first panel member. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, before I do introduce uh, the other three members of our panel, I mean, the reason we're really here tonight, we, we do so much online today we basically live online we work online we communicate um everything so much of what we do is digitally and the fact that the australian economy the australian digital economy on average every year is worth around 457 billion dollars tells us how important and crucial it is to grow our industry and make sure the capabilities at a national level are there and that we are protecting we are protecting our privacy, our data, our um, information, but at the same time, we're protecting the other industries because cybersecurity is the enabler of our industries. And if you look at what drives the WA economy, yeah, mining, agritech, um, so many other industries within WA that really um, that really rely and are and underpinned by cybersecurity, it's extremely critical that now the government takes a really hard look um, at a state level and a national level, what we're doing in terms of protecting our industries, our critical infrastructure, our people. Um, so, speaking about growing the this, this cybersecurity industry, it doesn't get much more important than growing it, as I said earlier, from the ground up. And I'm a big advocate, as I said, for grassroots cybersecurity and engagement with schools. So, speaking of schools, there is Probably no other school in WA, and I'm going to say this um, without, you know, with being blunt and honest, there's no other school in WA that comes close to driving cyber security the way Joseph Bank Secondary College has been doing for the last few years. There are many teachers around WA that are driving cyber security, but as an entire institution, Joseph Banks is at the very forefront, and with their um, P Tech industry partnership. Um, with their students and now also with, well, through North Metro TAFE in delivering the Cert 3 in cyber security at their school, it's becoming bigger and bigger and it's a, a testament to how um, important cyber security is but also in how um, important the academic institutions are now looking at cyber security. So I'd like to introduce um, the principal of Joseph Bank Secondary College, Eleanor Hughes. Yeah, that one. I've got mine, you guys got oh, just reset it. Um, our next panel member is again, we talk about institutions that take cyber security very seriously. South Metro Tape. I was at an event there late last year where they were showcasing the Cyber Check Me program to their students, and we'll talk a little bit about Cyber Check Me um, while we have our panel discussion. But I could not believe while I was at this, at this event, they actually had some pizza inside. And I thought the line, because it was a massive queue of people, was for yeah, the pizza in the, the discussions they had there. It wasn't for the pizza, it was actually to sign up. The students were there signing up 
for the cyber check in program. I think every single student in attendance was signing up to it. Um, and they take cyber security very seriously and at the very head of their IT programs we have Dennis Holden. Come up please Dennis, thank you. And last but not least, just to give you an example of how small Perth is, I used to teach this guy when he was in high school. Um, and he's kind of come full circle because he's probably teaching me more about cybersecurity <laughs> these days. But I'd like to introduce to you a um, cybersecurity student here at Edith Cowan University, a cyber check me um, absolute dynamo. And, um, and when I say the word guru again, our student guru, Adam Brickhill, come up please. This is the part of the evening where we all get nice and cosy and take a seat and all kind of relax. Thank you. We do need a food, it needs to be a fireside kind of chat, doesn't it? All right, well, thank you very much for, for coming, everyone. We'll, um, we'll go on straight into the questions, I guess. And this one's actually for uh, Dr. Michelle. Um, so being an academic institution at the very forefront of cybersecurity education, what skills does ECU equip its graduates with to take with them on their careers? I think I can only sort of reiterate really what, um, and I miscued your cue there. I thought you had called me up to the front, and that's why I came up ahead of the time. I think I'd just like to go back over the idea about um, being curious. Um, again, having a look at what sort of has happened um, before, learn from, from uh, um, history, and um, to take it. Um, make it your own and take it forward and do something use useful with it. Like anything, research, um, read about it, learn from it, perfect it, practice it, um, and you know, see what, how it all works and, and be curious. So as far as the university, what we tend to do is, it was, um, apart from the technical side of things, which comes with the, with the university of course, we also, and part of my role is also to, do, um, to develop the soft skills in our students. Um, by help getting them to provide workshops and activities to um, engage with high school students in particular, um, to get them to use their technical skills to develop um, challenges that we can run for our Perth versus Canberra CTF. And we have some great um, cyber hackers over there, so that's quite good, they let's quite a star. Um, and, um, and with that, that they can then become um, leaders that they can uh, communicate, they can collaborate, they can work independently um, and work from home or work with a group. So yeah, sort of like multifaceted uh, soft skills. Great, thank you very much for that fantastic answer there. Um, my next question is for Dennis Colton. So being, a, being um, involved with the TAPES and knowing that WA TAPES have always been the leaders of uh, providing practical skills-based education, what can a student undertake with study in cybersecurity as South Metro Tate expect to learn during their time there? And what general advice can you give to them? Um, thanks, Simon. Uh, I just want to say TAFE at South Metro Tate and North Metro Tate, we're all TAFE, it's just a river that separates us. So the courses are actually the same, and we um, work together in course material at times. So it's a pretty consistent approach. Um, so if you see advertising about a wonderful security operations centre at Murdoch, but you live in Joondalup, it's just as fine to go to Joondalup to study and get exactly the same education they've got the single facility as well. Um, with, with TAFE, I think, um, I, I did write some notes because I could talk about TAFE forever and I wanted to be pretty succinct about this, but the first of all, the courses are really cheap in cybersecurity. Um, and for some people who might be switching careers or starting out, um, Financial pressures is a real thing. So to go into cybersecurity, especially the Cert Four, um, it's 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 really cheap. I don't like quoting figures, but like under fifteen hundred bucks for a full year, um, including resource fees, which is like crazy. And if you've got a healthcare card, it's even cheaper. Um, they are quick to complete. It's a twelve month course, and after that, you are job ready to get a career in the industry. Now, I'll have a caveat on that. If you come straight out of high school and you finish your certificate four you probably need to have some projects um, to help back up to build up that experience because still it's only 12 months in 
like the industry, I guess you could say. Um, TAFE is taught by industry experts. They all need to be able to continuously demonstrate their skills so they can um, get, be teaching the right way and the right thing so you can be confident in what you learn. It's all hands-on teaching, so it's um, you go in there and you do. It's not just um, listening and then having to write it down and hopefully uh, retain it that way. Um, we have Sailor Art Labs. We're really lucky in Western Australia. We are pretty well funded for computing, um, so that's good. Uh, TAFE is a great learning environment. It's um, a great place to start your network for your career because there's a lot of students in cybersecurity at the moment. There's excellent job outcomes, or you can articulate to all the universities. They all want TAFE students because they recognise the value of their skills going in. Um, but the last thing I want to say, none of that matters if you have no passion for IT, and that's going to be the strongest driver for you to get in your career, and hopefully you build that take. Fantastic. A really good point at the end there. You need to have a way, I guess, for anything that you want to do in life, but definitely, definitely the IT and security. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Uh, my next question is for Eleanor. We all know, especially after hearing from our industry experts tonight, just how important cybersecurity is and how fast the industry is growing. How does the Joseph Banks EdTech partnership prepare students who wish to embark on further studies in this area? Thanks, Simon, and thank you for the opportunity to talk as well. Um, so the Pathways in Technology partnership that we have started about 18 months ago, and it's a program that is sponsored by the federal government for two years. And it's set up uh, to establish our school to work with industry partners in a specific industry. And for us, luckily, it was um, cyber security. So when we first started out, we didn't really know much about cyber security and how it was going to work in the school. But the intent was to grow the workforce. Um, and so working with our industry partners, we brought them into the school, uh, along with some parents and some students and we workshopped what they thought we needed to be teaching our students to make them um, viable candidates for the future. Um, and out of that, we developed a Year 10 program which we call Cyber, uh, Cyber Solutions. Um, and it's based on project learning or problem-based learning. And the industry partners work with us each term. In first term, the industry partners give the students a problem that all of the students work on in small groups to, to solve. And the idea of that is to introduce them to um, cyber security essentials, I guess, and to build a language around what it is that they need to know going forward. Um, and then the following term, um, they work on another pro uh, problem, but each group is working on a different problem. Again, a, a problem that is supplied by industry. They have industry mentors who work with them um, to find a solution to the problem that they're working on. And part of that, and you've heard these things mentioned all this evening, is to develop their soft skills, to develop their communication, to develop their confidence, to develop their teamwork, to, de to develop their collaboration. When they're working in groups, they're not allowed to work with their friends, and some of them have joined the class as friends, but they have to actually develop um, the, the means to work with others in, in those groups. In terms three and four, the students create their own problem and then they have to design the solution to that problem. Again, working with the industry mentors, um, they have opportunities to go into the industry um, offices and, and see how things work there uh, to get a broader perspective of, um, I guess, the operations of the company as well. And um, they then have to, to to present the solution to their problem that they've been working on for two terms to a very large audience. The audience consists of industry people, it also consists of um, parents and family, but also schools and tertiary institutions as well. Um, so that's in year 10. We've also got a program that starts in year nine, which is Cyber Security Essentials. And then in year 11, um, our students, um, through a really wonderful partnership that we've established with North Metro TAFE, and Marie is over in the back there, um, we have um, TAFE trainers who come to our school to deliver cert, a Cert 3 in um, IT and networking, and they can focus in cyber security. What that allows us to do is for our students who want to do an ATAR course, they can do an ATAR course and an additional Cert 3, which supplements their um, requirements for waste, which is what they, they get at the end of Year 12. 
So we've just started that, and so far the feedback, we have two classes of students who are undertaking the Cert 3. Um, the feedback that we're getting from the trainers, but also from our students, is that it's working really well. Our ATAR students um, are more relaxed because they don't have to leave campus, they're on site, and that means that they have the support from um, people at school as well. So uh, we're really excited by that, and um, we think that that's going to grow and develop further as well. So a few ways um, that we're starting to do uh, uh, quite a bit of work in that, that area. Simon, you did mention that I should talk about what's coming next. Shall I do that now, Simon? Um, absolutely. Yep. So. Um, Last year, the government, the state government gave us some funding for a stage three build. Um, schools nearly seven years old um, and we're growing very, very quickly. As part of that, um, we will have a space science education centre and what we want to be able to do is develop our focus on space technology, um, looking at a whole range of remote operations, robotics and um, making sure that the cyber security is the theme that runs through everything. And again, you've heard that this evening from industry people, um, that cyber, cyber security really connects everything. Um, so we're pretty excited by that. We see um, that uh, space technology, remote operations, and all those sorts of things connect to what's happening in Western Australia in terms of um, jobs and, and the workforce um, well into the future. So um, that's it, Simon. <laughs> Great timing there too. Thank you very much, Eleanor, for that very comprehensive response to what um, what Joseph Banks is doing um, around not just cyber security but emerging technologies and emerging industries such as space technology as well. So that's fantastic to hear. And I'm sure there's a lot of schools around WA that will love to replicate what's going on there at Joseph Banks. Um, my next question is for Adam Brickhill, but um, I'm going to change the question a little bit because we've mentioned cyber checkmate. Yeah, I'll put you on the spot, but you're quite good at this, so I'll, you know, you can deal with that. Um, sure. We mentioned CyberCheck Me a couple of times tonight, so I thought, who's, who better to talk about CyberCheck Me and what it actually is and what it does for students and the um, or WA industry and small businesses than one of the dynamos from, uh, from CyberCheck Me, sorry, Guru, I should say, Adam. And right. So, um, CyberCheck Me is uh, fantastic. Uh, kind of just gets um, you into uh, the best next thing to work experience in a real uh, kind of workplace um, because what you're doing is uh, you're working with real companies and giving them security consulting or you're uh, standing up at maybe Bunnings or something like that and kind of picking people off as they walk past and trying to teach them about security and uh, what it means to have secure passwords and securing their data and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, and it actually brings in a really good opportunity uh, for people like me and uh, some TAFE students to kind of uh, not get, uh, not have to go for the, um, getting a job at McDonald's or that kind of thing. Like you kind of uh, can be in a job that you want to be in and still make money and uh, have a little bit of spare change. And, um, yeah. Uh, that's, that's fine. I mean, CyberCheck is an amazing program, and, yeah. and we we support it as much as we can from our cyber perspective. And I know that the City of Jubilee and the City of Bonnaroo all they came on a few years ago as, as policies to, to partner up with the program, so they support it very well um, too. And it, it really is the only job saver and job maker in, in WA. It really is. Um, it's providing students with um, not just an opportunity to gain the experience, but they get paid as well, which I think is a fantastic thing. We don't believe the slave over here. We, we actually, you know, um, put them out there to the businesses and they get paid for it, which I think is fantastic. And just going to be for everybody because these businesses who wouldn't necessarily get access to a consultant, because again, um, if you're a sole trader or a startup, um, it's, it can be too expensive. And again, it's not the first thing on your mind all the time. I ran a workshop yesterday in Mantra for small businesses without cyber security. And my first question was, it ends up in cyber security is the first thing on your mind, the last thing on your mind every day. And then, of course no one's going to put their hand up if they want to go and do their day-to-day -day job, they want to have turnover. So um, it's just being able to provide that and it's also being able to simplify cyber security because if you break it down to the set, the eight or nine controls that you just need, 
is actually quite simple, and especially as a sole trader or small business to actually get on top of your security. So I think I'm just working on that. Yeah, and I, I got to see um, a lot of people have a lot of problems in their businesses as well, which, um, you know, big corporations, they have those uh, cyber security people to kind of solve those little things. Um, but in those smaller businesses, they never think about it. Um, and just like uh, some uh, chef that I had to work with, um, he did all these accounting online. And so uh, his Wi-Fi was accessible outside the premise, and it was very easy for someone to connect to his Wi-Fi, and you could start snooping and seeing all the uh, accounting information that uh, he's delivering off. And uh, yeah, that was pretty scary. So even just a chef, that owns a little rinky-dink company, I think it was in Subiaco. Um, yeah, and so I opened up his eyes, and uh, now he has a nice, secure uh, workplace. No, it definitely is an eye open, and it also goes to show how everyone's got a target in their back, so you know, no, one's, you know, no one can escape cyber security, it's, it's, everyone is a target. Um, but I should also point out that it's not just Edith County University that, that runs the cyber checkpoint program, it is also South Metropolitan Tape and or Metro Tape as well yeah. that, um, that we might have on the program too. So there's a lot of, um, we're really good at the industry, there's a lot of future talent out there. Um, I'm going to ask one more question of each of you now, and uh, I'm going to borrow uh, a bit from Michelle Price's playbook, the CEO of Boss Cyber. She asks this at all of her, whenever she runs a panel discussion. Um, if, and I'll start with Michelle and work towards me. If I were to give you a blank check tomorrow that says you can have anything you want to um, aid you in cyber security education, what would that be? Uh, petrol money. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, because we could use it to um, bus ourselves to the various locations and share the knowledge. Um, the amount of scams and schemes that are going around at the moment and uh, money that's being um, ex exited from Australia to overseas um, is quite horrendous. And I think if we had some petrol money to drive around to the different places, including what we do with off cyber and, and with cyber check me, um, just so that people know just some basic things. Uh, people are the uh, lowest denominator um, in that they are the ones who uh, passwords, uh, phishing, and uh, what was the third one on that slide? Um, human error. Pardon? Human error. Yes, yeah, so human error is another one. Thank you. Um, yeah, so virtual for me. Thank you. Hello. Well, um, we're getting a building, but we're not going to get all of the technology that we'd really like in the building. Um, so I would be asking for um, the specific, uh, well, not specific, but technology that's going to last into the future, um, because what we've seen is that technology changes very rapidly. And so from a cyber security perspective, what's going to be right at the cutting edge when the building opens and how can we have something that's going to last uh, the test of time with our students um, as we take them forward. Great response, thank you. Yes. Um, as a father of young kids and being active in my daughter's and son's primary school, which is Fletcher Park, um, yeah. <laughs> um, I, if, if I had an unlimited checkbook, I would actually probably give all the primary schools um, actually sufficient electronic resources to be able to teach the digital literacy curriculum properly and um, have money there for the teachers to actually train so they can keep up with the students by the time they get to you know, high school. And um, I think if we can start at an earlier age, we can get rid of a lot of these um, incidental human error problems that um, people get taken advantage of. That's a fantastic response. I agree 100% with that. Yeah, I think definitely I would go for um, fixing small business, uh, just giving small business a chance um, and making sure that all of those guys can have as much technology as they need and as much help uh, as they need from companies uh, like uh, uh, Piranha and stuff like that to kind of, you know, give them a helping hand and give them a shelf. All right, thank you. All right, yeah. Well, so thank you guys for those responses. That's great. What I'm going to do now, guys, is I'm going to open up the floor. So I think we've got time for maybe three good questions. But opening up not just to the panel, but to anyone that spoke tonight as well. So just raise your hand if you've got to just call it out. Um, Please. Well, 
bit of advice would you give to uh, just a small business owner right now with the current threat landscape and the way security is to try to get them to change from it's not going to happen to me? That's a really, really, really good question. Would anyone like to answer that before I give a really poor attempt? Oh, I'm joking. I'm point. Yes. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. Fantastic. Good example. Just given that, sorry, some of the stuff we do, which really shocks us, is we get them to throw their password into I'll give you an example. This is a um, one of our client policies. So, here we go. Here we go, and Jim, uh, my name is Blaine, I'm from the IT department. I see that you're working from home now. All, all I want to do is do a quick survey of what um, systems you're working on at the moment. Are you having any problems accessing anything? Straight away, because she's working from home, it could be a coincidence, she's starting, I'm starting to validate that they're all real. And she goes, oh, do not play your ring. I'm trying to access system A and I can't get in. Oh, what system is that? Yeah, look, it's our SAP system and we use it for our maintenance and uh, look, my password's not working. Oh, brilliant. Okay, do you know anyone else that's got problems with this? Yeah, you know what? I was just um, you know, uh, speaking speaking before to Bill and Bill's got the same problem. Oh, brilliant. Look, you wouldn't have Bill's number, would you? And I'll give him a call. Yeah, he's Bill's number. <laughs> and then you ring Bill. Listen, I was just talking to the shit and now I've just validated myself. Yeah, I know that person. And she was saying that you've probably got problems with um, SAP for M. Yeah, so now I'll validate that point as well. Look, what we'll do, we'll re reset your password. Just if you just give me your current password, your name and password, and I'll, I'll enter the system, I'll give you it, and I'll reset it. Mm -hmm. Bang. And, there and that's as simple as it gets. And I haven't used one computer system. 
So fishing doesn't have to be from a computer system. And this is happening in a large, you know, uh, metals and mining company in Perth. So, you know. One of the customers I had, uh, today, based off of that, they actually got it off an advertisement on the, oh, that's fine, okay. They um, basically found a link online, they were just checking their normal news, and it was an advertisement that came through Google AdSense. They clicked on it, you know, they wanted to get their cryptocurrency, you know, they wanted to make more money, okay, they sound legitimate, they spoke to them, three, three different phone calls, each time they sounded like a legitimate business, they logged onto their computer, oh, how do you do crypto, oh, we do it this way opens up his browser, next minute, oh yeah, we do it this way, all of his cryptocurrency is gone. Just like that. I get a phone call, um, I can't get my crypto, where is it? Sorry mate, it's gone. How about your bank account? Oh, let me check, it's empty. $25,000. And all it took him was three phone calls and all they used was um, a quick any desk login to help him train how to do it. So, and that, that was the exact same customer who said, it's never going to happen to me. So, so now we, you know, we go down the path of track retraining, but he's lost all that and he has to go down through, you know, talk to banks and do all that stuff. But uh, yeah, but that's the other way I've noticed this happened right like, through what I do as well. Just a simple advert on a Google AdSense and a guy lost. $25,000. Wow, and there's there's your evidence and there's your why as well. Yeah. Um, and yet, honestly, uh, I've had the experience and then Solana does too, like and what she does is um, getting that buy-in from the C-suite. Um, because that's where you need it from, right? And it's just providing that evidence, giving them the why. What is going to cost you? Sometimes it's, it's money, sometimes it's not just money. Um, we've got time for one more question. Awesome. First response is so that my first response would be, what do you want to do? Yeah, do you want to be so? For example, do you want to be a, a, a developer? Do you want to be a security analyst? Do you want to be a threat hunter? You know, so there's, there's as we were saying, there's so many different roles, right? Um, if you're into, and I heard before, you know, I think you're the right person that's uh, doing coding. So what, what code are you, you in the mind? What, what, what language are you using? Spot on? Yeah. So at the end of the day, I, I don't go out and say, I need someone who can program in X language. The mere fact that you're doing that, the mere fact that you're here, the mere fact that you're asking the question, you're on the right path. Yeah. The only challenge I'd have for you now is that there's so many different roles, what, what, what suits you? You're the kind of person and this is going to go over your head, I'm sure, because uh, you probably don't know what Cluedo is. But back in my day, we had this game called Cluedo, right? And Cluedo was about, it was a board game. Uh, okay, how about I explain that? Um, they're board games, yeah. Um, and so, they didn't take me off, they were not telling jokes. So, in, 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 that, in that type of arena, it's about finding, you know, it was Reverend Green in the, in the library with a candlestick, yeah? And that's what a threat hunter does. You know, or do you want to design and, and really enhance that next detection engine that's going to detect the threat? You know, so you've got to find where your passion is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So once you find that passion, you can really start to you know, navigate through what, what you need. Can I just add that um, maybe at some capture the flag competition because they've got different um, different areas that you can try skills at and see if something really grabs you in there as well. And then you might get a bit clearer in your career path as well. Yes, what on? You know, just that from a soft selling piece, but I mean, what I feel um, especially with what we do is it's about you learning the language. And I learned Java in those days and SQL and whatnot. It was about how. 
I know, and I scored really well the second time. I failed time. I got 98% the second time, so here, here goes. But um, jokes apart, I think it's about being able to translate that into other languages that you learn. It will turn over very, very quickly. And your ability to be able to be resilient and be like, okay, I need to learn this new language. Just being able to know how to solve that, how to translate that, that's really, really important, I think. That's right, thank you. Um, question? No, it's just for, for the, um, the, the kids. Um, for the kids, like year, year 11s, year 12s, year 10s, um, there's a really good sort of flow chart that shows some of the different, a lot of the different directions that you can take in cybersecurity, and it might help them in terms of where they actually want to head to, and it's not all just like pen testing and threat hunting and that, and it might help them understand all of the branches, I guess, if you want to call it that. So I can give it to you later, Simon, if you want, and it might help them. Yeah, right, that's fantastic, and it's a good point. We are on the way to email addresses, so we will share um, information related to the Microsoft Seminar with you all um, after this as well. Look, um, it's been a really long day for a lot of people, so I, I really want to first of all thank our expert panel and our expert speakers for coming along tonight. You have no idea how uh, much I appreciate your commitment to this evening and being part of it, and um, yeah, hanging around right to the end and, and really giving um, our, our audience some really valuable information. I know that. At the end of a very long day, you can feel like, you know, mankind up and take a hell of a cell, and it's really just, oh, absolutely smashed. But um, your dedication today has been amazing. So thank you so much. So a big round for our speakers. And <laughs> um, also to, to all of you for turning out tonight. We've had, this is a fantastic turnout, much like better than I expected. Yeah, we got there. So, absolutely. So, which is fantastic. So, come on, come on. And the students, all the way from Duncan College of the Arts, the Green Man Group. Um, so, absolute commitment there for coming all the way to South Geraldton and being a part of this year as well. So, and all to, to all of you, you probably, I don't know how many of you shoot out already, there's a few names still there, but for tuning in and then watching us tonight. And again, this has been filmed by. The fantastic uh, Kunja, who's... My pleasure. Uh, it's all my pleasure. Thank you. And, um, and also someone with an absolute passion for cyber security. I've had the, um, the pleasure of having coffee a few times with, yep. with Kunja, and her, um, just hearing that her um, passion for cyber is really inspiring stuff, and her knowledge is amazing. So. My journey from a mother to... from a kitchen to cyber security lab. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you so much for doing it tonight because we are going to, um, as I said, I'm going to heavily edit this, but it will go out there and um, I'll share this with everyone at a later date as well. So um, thank you and thank you again, Nashid and, and Beck. And the CEO as well, of, um, the CEO of Jindra for coming out tonight. Thank you, Matt, as well, for coming out tonight and um, being a part of supporting us um, with this as well. We have some love partnership we, we have with you guys and that uh, carries on for years to come. So, Thank you to all of you. You students, I hope you found some inspiring information tonight. Parents, you're amazing. You're just top parents just for bringing your kids out tonight as well. All the teachers and everyone else uh, for coming along tonight as well. You guys are amazing. Thank you very much. Do I still some sandwiches outside? Help yourself. You know, I think pretty quickly because then we're going to Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great evening.